a Korean shopkeeper in Los Angeles, Mrs. Young Sun Ha. I used to believe America was the best. I, I watched in Korea many luxurious uh, Hollywood uh, lifestyle movie. I, I never saw any poor man, any black. Until 1992, I used to believe America was the best. I still do. I don't deny that because I am a victim. But at the end of 92, when we were in such turmoil and having all the financial problems and all the mental problems, I began to really realize that Koreans are completely left out of this society and we are nothing. Why? Why do we have to be left out? We didn't qualify for medical treatment, no food stamp, no GR, no welfare, anything. Many African Americans who never work got minimum amount of money to survive. We didn't get any because we have a car and a house. And we are high tax payer. Where do I find the justice? Okay. 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 Many African Americans probably think they won by the trial. I was sitting here watching them the morning after the verdict and all the day. They were having a party. They said everything. All of South Central. All the churches. And they said, well, finally justice has been done in this society. Well, what about victims' rights? They got their right by destroying innocent Anna DeVere Smith merchants. from Twilight from the 1992 riots in Los Angeles tell us about these performances that you do as you embody different people and each one we just played one person you embody but you change you transform from one person to the next well when I was a girl my grandfather uh, told me if you say a word often enough it becomes you <clears throat> and I grew up in a fairly segregated city Baltimore Maryland and I suppose my journey has been to get over the fact that I was put in one place and told that's where I belonged and I wanted to know more and I didn't think that from that position I could exercise my curiosity and then as you know Whitman wanted to absorb America and have it absorb him so that's what I've been doing in these plays. Actually, I'd done 13 of them before Fires in the Mirror got um, some attention. And so I think of myself as putting myself in other people's words, the way you'd think of, of putting yourself in other people's shoes. So by performing studs over and over again, I've, I've learned some things about resistance um, and uh, about power. And by performing uh, Mrs. Young Sun Han over and over again, I've learned some things about loss. Um, and I suppose, uh, you know, it doesn't matter how many people you interview, you do come back to some of those essential themes. Uh, in this time where civil liberties uh, have, uh, to say the least, uh, been repressed for many people, uh, suppressed, um, thousands of people have been rounded up. We don't know their names. They often don't know their uh, charges against them. Many have been deported. How does your, reflect, your work reflect this in these last years? You know, I don't think it does. However, I'm going to have the opportunity uh, here at the Aspen Ideas Festival um, to recite a speech that um, I like very much of uh, the late Congresswoman Barbara Jordan um, addressing, actually, Howard University um, at the time that people were questioning um, Nixon's behavior. And, uh, and it's a, I would say it's the most eloquent um, piece of literature that I've come upon about, uh, about civil liberties. But I don't think that my work um, deals with that, especially in the way that you might like to see it deal with it. But you give voice to people that, while they may be able to speak, often other populations don't hear those voices. Well, my goal is to make communities through my work that don't exist yet. 
So for example, in my new play, Let Me Down Easy, <clears throat> which for all intents and purposes is about mortality and health care, on the other side of it, I have um, athletes. I mean, so I sort of, I'm always putting together things. If, if you think of my work like a dinner party, it's having people at the table who you'd never think of having at the table together. So. In that way, it's not just giving voice. I think it's also making juxtapositions of ideas that don't really um, come to mind immediately. You also perform uh, on television, West Wing. Yeah. And here we are in a presidential year. What mm. did that do for your art, to right. your art, well, to you? That was an interesting time because it's not, the, the West Wing is the least of it. I had actually spent five years in Washington uh, interviewing um, media, presidents, historians. I interviewed uh, three presidents, went on the Dole campaign and the Clinton campaign in 96, interviewed 520 people, and wrote a book called Talk to Me. Um, I'm sad to tell you, sorry to tell you that uh, most of the people behaved the way that a historian um, told me Jefferson behaved, which is that it was very hard to find Jefferson in verbal undress. So after 520 interviews, I can't say that uh, people told me as much as I would have thought. But at the same time that I was in Aaron Sorkin's movie, um, The American President, I had also been in Washington for five years um, trying to learn something about how uh, the people who have the power of um, the media, uh, the power of decision makers, how they are. And I think it's a very small group of people who are not as connected to the general public as we would like to think. There's the illusion that they are, but, but they are not. And certainly if we talk about people who are really suffering or who are really in need, I think there's a great distance to be. Um, uh, there's a huge bridge that we still don't have yet in, in our culture. How do you maintain authenticity as an artist? That's a very good question. Um, I, well, I, don't, I, I hope I do. I don't want to sit here and presume that I do or, or even know what you mean by authenticity. I will say that I have tried to escape the trap of being caught in the privacy and the safety of a, a studio. The same is true of my work as an academic. And that by you, go, using real people, constantly going into the world, constantly going um, to the world to, as the place where I find meaning and resources, let's, I won't be as presumptuous as to claim my own authenticity, but I will say that I work very hard to stay connected with the world at the same time that I'm concerned about developing my own skills. You end your book, Letters to a Young Artist, with the section, The Death of Cool. What do you mean? The Death of Cool. Well, you know, there was the birth of cool, you know, Miles Davis. Um, I think we should uh, have the death of cool. I, I, I talked to Wynton Marsalis about it. He said, yeah, I think it's time for it to be dead. He said, and when I talked to Miles, Miles only had answered, Miles told me there's only one answer to any question. The answer was no. And um, so I think the answer should be yes, and that we should be willing uh, to be emotional and passionate. And uh, the sort of studied nonchalance that we see in the media, you know, the. Uh, the kind of cynicism and even know-it-all postures that people have, I'm not so sure, invite the kind of engagement that we need at the moment. Anna DeVere Smith, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, her latest book, Letters to a Young Artist, Straight Up Advice on Making a Life in the Arts for Actors, Performers, Writers, and Artists of Every Kind. We're here in Aspen. She is uh, going to be speaking and performing at the Ideas Festival here. We're broadcasting from the oldest public access TV station in the country. It's called Grassroots TV. We'll be back with Reverend Jim Wallace talking about Barack Obama's speech yesterday in Ohio. Stay with us. Thank you.